Hi everyone. A uh, little surreal seeing your own face introducing yourself before you introduce yourself, but here we go. Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about security in the DevOps world. So before we start, who is this guy? Uh, my name is Peter Suda. Um, I'm a technical account manager at HashiCorp, which is basically I work with customers. You know, we have an enterprise product as well as the open source. Um, doesn't mean that I don't care about open source. I still an active open source contributor and I like doing stuff like that, but my kind of primary role is working with the people that buy our enterprise product. Um, I'm from the UK, uh, from London actually. Uh, one of the things that I really need to actively think about whilst I'm doing this is that I speak very quickly, even for um, someone from London who generally speak quite fast. So me speaking at this rate right now is probably about a third of my normal speed just like that. Uh, and I know that lots of people here have English as a second language, um, so you're already ahead of me because I can just about do one. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll be talking about... Um, oh yeah, so what, uh, what have I done in my time? I've done a lot of things. I've worked at... Uh, I used to be more in a config management space, worked at, Hash uh, worked at um, Puppet. Um, I used to do sort of lots of consulting. I worked on some UK government projects, which kind of got my interest in security in the first place. Um, and yeah, I like, I'm really interested in making people's lives better and more secure, uh, and I like DevOpsing all the things. So what is DevOps? This is a question that has been kind of going around for a long time. Um, obviously, I could do an entire talk just on this topic, so we'll stick to the kind of core ideas. Um, DevOps originally came from agile principles applied to a kind of sysadmin world. Um, Patrick Dubois, in his talk, I think it was 2007, uh, was talking about applying agile principles. You have, you know, the Etsy talk about delivering 10 deploys a day and things like that. Um, but where we are now, um, it's generally about removing silos. You have the literal uh, removing silos there, breaking down the wall between the two teams. Um, it's really, as we said, it comes from agile methodology. So it's about iterative delivery of software, but making sure that it's not iteratively delivered over a wall, waterfall style to an operations team. And ultimately, you know, not to sound too businessy, but it's about delivering customer value because an application that you can't deploy because your dev team is just throwing it over the wall to operations isn't really useful for anyone. Um, and yeah, the acronym CALMS um, is a pretty common term in DevOps. Culture, automation, lean, uh, measurement, and sharing. Um, the idea is that as we are gonna talk about in here, um, DevOps is not a product or a particular single process. It's lots of different processes, it's people. Um, there's actually a pretty good uh, tweet uh, from Sonia Gupta um, talking about uh, the kind of core idea of DevOps is do things in small loops and uh, stop being a jerk to your coworkers. Although I think there was a slightly more uh, harsh word used at the actual talk. So how the things used to look before the kind of idea of, uh, of DevOps? And this is even going even further back. So this is from... Uh, uh, Wilson Royce's Managing the Development Cycle of Large Software Systems from 1976, real page turner. Um, if uh, you went to, when I went to university, even though I graduated in uh, 2010, this is the kind of software delivery that we were talking about. Agile was still, even nine years ago, Agile was still like, uh, but it's probably not gonna be like this. You're probably gonna work at a bank and have to deliver things like this. So you have this literal kind of uh, waterfall uh, method. Things go kind of down the stack. Um, you know, for anywhere from the first stage of the kind of original requirements to the actual delivery of the software could be years, could be even decades. There's a very famous um, IT project in the UK. Uh, it's actually technically, depending on how you define it, it's still going on now for the NHS kind of IT uplift that I know people that have kind of been working on and off for the last two decades on it. So this is the kind of thing that happens if you have these kind of large, slow, non-iterative delivery processes. So what is the new way of looking like? So first there was a kind of agile idea and then people were saying, well, what about when it gets to the operations team? Um, and they were like, okay, well, let's apply this to the whole kind of pie. And you have this iterative delivery cycle, you code, you build, you test, you release, you deploy, you monitor, you feedback. From that feedback, you plan and go back in. So instead of trying to do everything all at once and sometimes, you know, lots of things change in the world, not just in software in three years. Are you trying to deliver the same thing that you planned for three years ago? Sometimes entire technology stacks will have changed by then. Look at something like Docker, where the entire approach to something like networking has basically changed every two or three years at this point. Although it's starting to settle down now, at least. So we've enabled the DevOps culture. We have this kind of cool loop. Everything's kind of going around. We've got this nice Venn diagram. We've got Dev. We've got Ops. Right in the middle, we've got DevOps. That's what the awesome is. Uh, everything's pretty awesome. 
But one thing that's kind of been coming up, and just like in any kind of new idea, people are starting to say, well, what about this other thing that comes along? And one of the big things that comes up is security, is sec. Um, so you've got this kind of cool Venn diagram of dev and ops and how they go together. Well, how do you add in sec into this new bit? Maybe things aren't so awesome. Um, and in lots of discussions of DevOps, you have this idea of the wall of confusion. Um, this is kind of where the idea of throwing stuff over the wall goes to. Maybe you have this really awesome DevOps delivery cycle, um, and then right at the end, you chuck it over the wall to security and say, okay, you guys need to pen test this. You need to figure out if we're doing stuff in the right way. And vice versa, the security team are going to every so often just throw stuff over the wall and say, oh, you forgot to use this particular library, or we're completely changing how the security stack works. So ultimately, you're kind of having the speedboat of DevOps and you're having the security uh, anchor just pulling along the seabed and making everything slow. So in a way, security becomes the new silo. And some of that is that security is kind of lagging behind a lot. Um, I'm sure lots of people here have had the experience of uh, shadow IT or having security people who default to no. Um, they make you fill out really long forms and requirements. Nothing is automated. These are lots of times most people's experience of security is going to be a black box process where you give it over to a team, something happens, weeks, months pass by, and they come back and say you failed on the following things. You don't know what tools they're using, you don't know why things failed, you don't know the reasons that they even tested these things in the first place. It's just not a very good look, really. Um, and this is a tweet that if anyone, people talk about uh, DevOpsSec as we're going to in the future, this comes up quite a lot, Please check, uh, Pete Cheslock's tweet. The original image was dev on the left as the unicorn and ops on the right, and it's been kind of built on and built on and iterated to be more uh, the sec team on the right, cleaning up the awesome, super fast unicorn on the left. And yeah, what does this actually look like? What are the disadvantages of having this really slow process? So if you've seen the Wizard of Oz, um, Dorothy and the rest of the team have been traveling all this way and they just want to see the wizard and she wants to get back to Oz and there's just a guy at the gate who's just like, no one gets to see the wizard. There's nothing you can do about it. And she spent all this time and effort trying to iterate and deliver, which is trying to get back to Oz, uh, sorry, to get back to Kansas and she can't get there just because this one guy's blocking her. Um, and this is the kind of big rise. Security seems to be behind uh, Shadow IT probably most of the times I experienced it. So I used to work um, for the UK government, uh, either via kind of like uh, consulting teams or you know various other kind of subcontracting through um, pro service and things like that. And this is one of the biggest things that came up was you had all these kind of, because it was government stuff, you had quite a lot of high, uh, quite high tech security requirements. And most of these processes were either super out of date or didn't make much sense. And when you try to dig into why they were chosen in the first place, weren't really uh, transparent and accurate. Um, you slow delivery time down because every time you do something you have to go through this black box process again. Devs and PMs are frustrated, you're gonna have a lot of people leaving um, and uh, yeah you can't use cool two technologies and you can't innovate. You can't deliver value to customers in the first place. If anyone's ever read the Phoenix Project there's quite a funny uh, example in the, in the novel of the one security guy who's trying to like kind of blow up the whole process and as the uh, book goes on he starts to realize that his job is not to do security, it's to deliver security to an end customer, which is ultimately what you actually want to achieve. Cool, so you're like, okay, security is a pain in the butt, let's just get rid of them completely. Well, that's not really an option either. Um, with no sec processes, you're basically kind of flying blind, you're having all these problems. Um, the ones that come up and the ones that come up in the, the kind of news a lot are things like crypto ransom and data theft, loss of customers, legal and PR fires. Those are the kind of things that make you know, senior people with a lot of money pay attention. But the kind of lower end stuff is just you know, general kind of paper cuts of sec problems happening all the time and you have no one to really answer for them. Um, and the, the ultimate thing is just like in anything in life, you can't stop everything. All you can do is kind of have controlled failure points. Um, you are, if you try and stop water completely, the water is gonna win. You know, in this example, we got the uh, Hoover Dam in the background there. Um, the power of the water is enough to power electricity for an entire area around there. Um, you have this idea of defense in depth. Instead of just trying to block everything off, you have multiple levers of kind of breakaway failures. So you're not just going, if something goes wrong, the entire thing blows up. Um, that's where the idea of reducing blast radius really comes from. Um, and ultimately you want to detect uh, oddities and outliers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and there's actually a great talk this morning, uh, I can't remember who was giving it, but one of the things that he mentioned was that um, he made the analogy that if security are the cops or the police, then the, their job is not to go around ticketing people, 
their job is to make sure that there are safety rails and guards and making sure you don't break the law in the first place. Because ultimately, when you get to that um, end point of someone breaking a rule, either intentionally or unintentionally, some process along the way has caused the problem. So what do we do? Um, and this is where uh, I kind of philosophize about naming and the problems with naming in the future. So uh, one of the approaches and one of the ones I'm kind of okay with um, is adding the new Venn diagram sec into the circle and calling it DevSecOps. Um, and this has had many names over the years. Um, you have Rugged Software or Rugged DevOps, Sec DevOps, DevOps Sec, like the ordering. I think DevSecOps seems to win a lot of the time because it's slightly more alphabetical. But um, and, and ultimately, the last one there, uh, DevOps. Isn't this just DevOps? Um, and yeah, the truth is it's kind of true because DevOps isn't literally development operations because you're probably involving your UX team, you're probably involving your testing team, you're probably involving other teams. DevOps was just the kind of the big kind of ticket items that most people understood is that you had this development team and they threw stuff over the wall to ops. So the naming, as we said, isn't really important because ultimately the approach is just smaller delivery cycles of value to the customer. So again, it's kind of going back to agile. So um, even naming it DevSecOps is kind of I wouldn't say controversial, but people are kind of in the same way that DevOps has become kind of a buzzword, DevSecOps has become the new buzzword because you're adding security in. Security sells a lot of products. Security is kind of like interesting and people sort of go around it. But ultimately, I'm not too fussed about it. If you're trying to uh, emphasize a new area that you're currently not doing, i.e. security, it's fine to use a different term. I'm not that fussed. Um, and yeah, rugged software as a term has actually been around for quite a long time. Um, it has this kind of manifesto, which is very kind of militaristic and it kind of rubs you in the wrong way. It's like, I'm rugged and my code is rugged, you know, I don't know. And it's very kind of like rah, rah, rah. But um, the core idea behind it makes sense, which is kind of like pragmatism and making sure that you know that your code is going to be used by bad actors and trying to figure out how to solve that before it becomes a problem. Um, and yeah, it's been uh, talked about uh, uh, in the past. It was actually by Gene Kim, who originally wrote the um, Phoenix project, and I really recommend watching that. So if you want to use the term rugged DevOps, more will power to you. But most people these days use DevSecOps. So as you said, the name isn't super important. I'll be using DevSecOps because it's kind of the chosen nomenclature, um, but ultimately it doesn't really matter. But the core concept and where everything kind of drills down, similar to the idea of iterative loops, because ultimately the term I'm going to be using is basically an iterative loop, is the shifting security left, just like with any other kind of um, iterative kind of process. So what does it actually mean? Um, just like anything else, you should be doing it closer to the cycle, because as many studies and practical experience have shown us, the further along a problem occurs, be it security, a dev problem, an ops problem, the harder it is to fix. Fixing the fact that you accidentally committed the AWS credentials in code it's going to be way easier than fixing it when you've accidentally pushed that to uh, a public instance that you know everyone on the internet can access and do bad things to. So ultimately, you want to pull everything to the left. You want to encounter these problems earlier. You want to stop throwing stuff over the wall to security. Um, so if we think back to the diagram we showed before, the idea of plan, development, test, deploy, and operate, we can actually start putting the security principles into each one of those areas. So this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is just one that I like to talk about a lot. Um, so planning, uh, people have different ways of bringing security into the planning process. Some people have like evil user stories where instead of saying, as a user, when I log into your website, I see my um, shopping basket. You can be like, as an evil user, when I log into your website, I can't see anyone else's basket. So it's assuming kind of malice intent from there. And it's a good way of kind of pulling um, and uh, almost anti-business requirements, kind of like a BDD style language, but for negative things, basically. Um, and security requirements in general. Obviously, it would be impossible to determine if every single feature that you're writing and delivering has a security component, but there are little ideas that come up, obviously things involving passwords and APIs and access control. Generally, you probably want to pull a security person in and look at those. So development. So generally, there's a kind of idea that you want to bake the kind of security process into your development process. So the older a, <laughs> there's a balance because generally the more mature your kind of framework is that you're using, the more kind of free sec testing has happened and the more uh, hardened it probably is. If you've written the rewrite of Rails, for example, that you've kind of done internally, 
you're probably the only ones using it, or maybe you have a kind of much smaller surface area than Rails itself. Rails itself has a huge amount of investment in it, loads of people are using it. It's been quite a lot of security research done on it. Um, and if you do have to write your own kind of security frameworks, you probably should start talking to the community, start talking to security people, have it audited, have it looked at kind of thing. So you want to make sure that at least from the first step, you're not starting on a bad footing. Um, and yeah, and that comes with sec focused code review. So um, I'll be showing some ways of doing that automatically later on. But ultimately, the idea is anything that looks security related or anything that you think might touch the security area, have someone who is a security person come in and look at the process. And this is kind of where um, security itself kind of has to change because a lot of security is quite, at least in the kind of legacy environment, it's very top, uh, top down. It's not really looking into the code. It's like, here are our auditing documents. You follow them. So having someone on your security side, a security champion who can look at code and give you kind of like quite a deep analysis of what the kind of security problems are is really valuable. Um, and to be fair, those people often cost quite a lot, but it's very useful. And yeah, testing, you know, just like any other testing, just like performance testing or standard unit testing or smoke testing. Um, <laughs> Let me uh, turn on caffeine. Yeah, sorry, I was talking too, ironically talking too slowly, it turned the screen off. Um, so static code analysis, there are a bunch of tools out there, especially for no, well-known frameworks that can look for your code. There's generally some sort of security linter for the big popular kind of code things. There's obvious stuff like evals or anything where you're taking unprotected user input. Um, pen testing, either internally or externally. Obviously, the more external it is, the more it's gonna be a black box. It's generally better to do it internally, but it's quite a hard skill to learn. Um, deployment, you want to make sure that you're patching things, your systems are hardened to a certain extent, you're not just using um, a base out of the box Linux install, you've done some basic hardening there. Um, and as, 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 as we said, like the further along right you go, the harder it becomes, the more ethereal it becomes, because things like anomaly and threat detection and observability, they're very hard to just do yourself. There's some tools that can help, which we'll be talking about later on, but it's a lot more abstract there. And right at the bottom is the really cool thing, uh, game days and red teams. So game days are give a certain team the ability to do a hack or try to do something internally, either on a dev version of the software or if you're really confident, a real version of the software, um, and try and find the problems. Um, so the idea is that these are basically your evil user stories done internally by a red team, which is the kind of security term for um, the kind of white hat hackers that you have internally that are trying to break things. And the reason that shifting left has become quite a popular term in the security world is that everything kind of flows down from shifting left. The more you're shifting left, the more embedded your processes are. Um, security stops being an afterthought. You stop chucking it over the wall, embeds in things, and it becomes a shared responsibility. And it's funny because when you start talking about security as everyone's responsibility, both sides start to panic a bit. Um, because the sec team are like, well, that means that you're going to get rid of us, similar to the, uh, the kind of companies where they think that DevOps is just firing all their ops and making devs write um, Puppet or Ansible code or Terraform code. It's not really what you're trying to achieve, right? It's about breaking down those things and making everyone's responsibility. Um, the analogy that uh, I remember hearing once was not everyone has to be an expert in fire safety, but everyone should be responsible for, like, for example, not leaving their bike in front of a fire exit. I don't have to be an expert in... Um, you know, fire temperatures and all these other kind of evacuation processes to know that I, as a non-fire expert, probably shouldn't be blocking the main way that we will have to leave the building. Um, so it becomes everyone's responsibility. That doesn't mean that there isn't some specialist person who's going to walk around your office and grab all the people if there's a fire alarm. Um, so the idea is that you have these um, SMEs, subject matter experts, and you have people that are security people, but you also embed it into processes so it's not all on their backs. So how does this look in teams? It's kind of similar to, and the, and the big kind of repeating pattern you'll see, is, as we said, this is a lot of this is the ideas of DevOps just applied to a new area. Um, you'll have kind of champions and embedded people um, in your squads or teams, or whatever the cool term is these days. You'll have a dedicated security person or maybe a floating security person. You'll also have a dedicated security team that have security kind of focused uh, stories and stuff that might not be involved in kind of the everyday thing. Um, and yeah, it's the same with dev and ops. Like you might have an ops person who comes in and says, oh, this deployment will work in this way. You have to follow these processes and vice versa. 
So just like with any other big process change, a lot of people start asking, where do we actually begin? Um, and just like with DevOps, you want to pick a particular area that's causing pain. You want to set a baseline, iterate, make it better, and have no big bang changes. So secret management is something that's come up a lot and something I've dealt with a lot in the past, which is why I like to talk about it a lot. Um, it reflects a lot of changes in the kind of um, operations world because a lot of the ideas that come from the new kind of secret sprawl, or sprawl come from some of the new ideas of approaches because secrets weren't that big of a deal when you had a free tiered app. When you had a free tiered app, you probably had, or maybe you had two free tier apps, one for staging, one for prod. You had two different secrets they had to worry about, probably some DB credentials, something like that. Not too hard to worry about. But in the modern world, you have serverless frameworks, you have containers, you have all these things. You have machines that might be up in five seconds and down the next. Um, the old way of assigning secrets to a dedicated host name, well, that host name might not exist in five minutes. Um, you know, everything's very ethereal now. You're moving from a kind of static to a dynamic environment, and you're moving from pets to livestock. And because of that, new approaches are needed, and obviously this applies to dev, ops, and sec. Everyone is involved in here. So if we're going to talk about secrets, we probably need to define them, at least in the scope of IT. So they're small, a few kilobytes at most. If you're talking about a secret that's multi-gigabytes, it's not really a secret at that point. It's more like an artifact that you need to hide. Um, they're required. If the software worked without them, it's not really a secret. Why do you need them in the first place? Uh, they're radioactive. The consequences of leaking them are severe. For example, some people encrypt their AWS username, um, but it's not really a secret because you can't do anything without the password. Some people are paranoid about it, but... Um, and yeah, so there's pretty good, pretty obvious examples, passwords, API keys, SSH keys, SSL certs. Anything you don't want someone who's not got the right permissions to have, person or machine. So different teams have different requirements here. You know, again, just like with any other process, different people have different interests here. The dev person just wants to use a technology, for example, just a database. The ops person wants the ability to deploy that database in a way that's secure. Security person obviously cares the most about security because it's their dedicated job. Um, they want to make sure that those credentials are provided following internal pro uh, policies. So everyone has different vested interests, but ultimately everyone's working for the same goal. They just have different ways of kind of approaching it. So we've got a secret baseline that we want to set. What we're going to do, we're not going to change any of the secrets yet. We're just going to iterate through our code. Um, we're going to find all the existing secrets. We're going to revoke them, rotate them, um, whatever we need to get rid of them in the first place. Because most people, you can't start automating having this awesome secrets world if the first thing that someone can do is find a .n file that has all your passwords in. There's no point doing that because then you're you know, having this really awesome security and then having the front door unlocked. So that's a good baseline to start with. So you can go really advanced with this. So the most obvious one, just git grep through your repos. Um, in this example, just a simple uh, shell script. I'm just going through my repos and looking for anything involving API key, username, password, blah, blah, blah. Again, there's no silver bullet for this because you might have a password in a file that doesn't use the word password, but it's a pretty good um, grepping thing. Just kind of start off and find the really obvious ones. And then as we go on, we can start being more uh, sophisticated. So the next one is truffle hog. So what this will do is it has a two-tiered approach. One, it will use the grepping from before, just in a nice automated way. The other is it will look for any string that's over a certain amount of complexity. Because again, you don't really know if a secret is there. Maybe you have AWS credential, um, but not stored with the word AWS in it. But if you have a string that looks interesting and over a certain amount of complexity, it probably is uh, some sort of secret. Again, it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be a secret. Maybe it's even in your documentation. It's just an example string. But it's a good way of kind of going through and finding stuff. So both of these approaches, the first one obviously is way, way slower. The second one will work, but again, you're going to have to be going for a lot of repos. So someone kind of took this to the next level uh, and made a tool called Git Rob. And what this will do is you point it towards an organization on GitHub and it will pull every single repo down. It will then do the approaches that we just did, but obviously on a way bigger scale. Um, so I actually did this <laughs> on the HashiCorp um, namespace recently and actually found some stuff. And the funny thing was, that it's quite good in a tree way because it will not only look at repos under your namespaces, it will look for all of the users in the organization and go down to their repositories that might not even be directly work related. But it's good to know that someone might have had something in their personal namespace that had a credential in it as well. Um, and yeah, it's pretty cool. It used to be in Ruby and uh, fall over a lot, but he recently rewrote it all to Git. Um, so it's a lot faster now, which is pretty cool. 
So let's say you've done this, you've used all these various approaches, there's probably other tools out there. Um, how do you stop them from being reintroduced? So part of that is the security code review process we talked about before, and just looking through, um, uh, during code review, obviously just going through and making sure that you're, uh, just like any other delivery, the bigger a pull request is, the easier it's going to slip through. So having smaller bite-sized pieces, you're more likely to detect the stuff. But there's a really cool tool called Danger CI, and what this will do is as part of a pull request process, you can have certain steps that stop a pull request from happening. Some of this is actually pulled more indirectly into GitHub now because you have review all processes and things like that. This was actually from about 2017. So things like the set approver and set reviews and stuff in GitHub didn't exist. But a lot of these are still pretty cool things you can do. In this example, obviously these are not all security things. Danger CI is not just for security, but it's a pretty good example. So Sentry, if you don't know, is a, is a tool that exists for automatically finding um, security bugs and bugs in general in live production environments. And actually in their GitHub repo, they have a good example of a danger file, which is the kind of configuration file you use for a danger CI configuration. And what this is doing, again, similar to the gripping approach we had before, if someone changes a file, so changes the danger file itself to obviously turn off this check, or is changing any file involving auth, login, permission, email, two-factor pseudo. You can see it's a Python app as well. It will add a note to the uh, pull request and say changes require at get sent to security sign off, which is a reference to a sub team within the organization. That will then send out a notification to the security team to review that. Obviously now the GitHub has the process of being able to block a review, uh, block a merge until a review is completed. You could even automate this a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool approach. It's a way of automating some of these processes. So cool, we've got rid of our secrets, uh, or at least we found the existing ones. We've got a way of stopping them from being reintroduced. Let's have a way of storing our secrets in a secure way and gating who can have control of things. So I work for HashiCorp. Um, I'm gonna be talking about one of the products we have for this, but it's a key thing I want people to know. Um, security is not something that you can be sold. Tools help. But just like DevOps, you can't just buy it in a box. You can't buy security in a box. There are some really cool tools out there. Uh, I will freely admit that I think Vault is one of the best in class for this. But Vault isn't going to solve the problem of your security team and your ops team not talking to each other. Because it can make the process a little easier, but ultimately someone's going to have to give access and configure things in the first place. It can actually force those conversations, but again, it's a people and process problem. There's no silver bullet software that's going to save your failing processes. Um, and yeah, the Ten CEO of Tenable, a pretty popular uh, security tool out there, he was at the RSA conference. I actually saw this, um, I think it was a few days ago, he actually talked about this, was that he basically said that a lot of security software is smoke and mirrors. And this is a guy that is the CEO of one of the biggest security tools out there. So don't just take my word for it. That all being said, let's talk about Vault. So Vault's authentication flow um, basically is the ability to, you have an authorization engine, um, you have a policy of who can have access based on that authorization, and then you have resources, so secrets. So in iteration one, we're dealing with static secrets. Um, you have the team on the left, they have been given a token. The token is either given to them statically or has some sort of authentication method. LDAP, GitHub, uh, everything can have 2FA as well to make sure people aren't leaking things. Um, there'll be a lease on how long they can use it for and things like that. Um, and then you have an app on the other side. The app is going, I need this credential for this amount of time. Vault is like, cool, here you go. Here's the uh, credential you need. So uh, the top app might be getting an API key. The bottom app might be using a root certificate. That's all pretty good. Um, and this is a pretty cool, we uh, revamped the Learn site recently. So we have a run, bunch of really cool diagrams. So this is a pretty good example. Who here has LDAP or Active Directory as a identity method at their uh, company? Pretty much everyone, right? Like Active Directory is like, it's almost impossible to escape it, even if you're not even at a Windows shop. And if you don't have Active Directory, you probably have LDAP in some form. So it's a pretty good way. You can map um, organizational units into policies. So if you're in this team, you can get access to certain things. Um, so the security team, again, we're talking about moving security left. Instead of security team saying, here's the policy you need to get the secret you need, you can say like, cool, I can just write that as a vault policy and have that. You're automating things and you're pulling that process in. Cool, so we've got, got rid of all our old secrets. Um, we've uh, put in places some controls to make sure the secrets don't get introduced, reintroduced accidentally. We now have a way of pulling stack secrets out in a secure way, 
policies and all that, everything's good. And one thing you'll notice as we go through these iterations is the further we go through the iterations, the harder and the more high, like kind of top-down view we're going to take. So we've got all our workflows, everything's good, but ultimately these are still static credentials. If I take one and I leave my laptop open or I accidentally, uh, I'm giving a talk and then I forget to remove the credentials from the screen, they're still going to get leaked. And because it's Vault, you can go and re uh, revoke those, but because it's static, you're going to have to go off and do that yourself. So let's do that and have them automatically made and have them uh, revocable and leasable within a certain time window. Uh, so Vault has the idea of various secrets engines. Um, one of the cool things that we've done recently is having self-rotation. So you uh, configure your Vault to talk to something like a database, so let's say Postgres. You give it a super user that can do whatever. Vault will actually rotate its own credential. So then after that, even if someone, another admin, tried to get in using that root credential used in the first place, it's already been rotated and stored in Vault. And you won't be able to get that secret out. So it's quite a cool process. Um, but then let's say you have an application or a developer. If a developer is something like, I need access to the staging DB for 30 minutes and I want it to be read only so I can't break anything. Maybe you're doing some sort of like saved query or I have an application and I'm like, in this application, I just need database access for like 30 seconds to a minute. You can create a credential, have it revocable and have it only last for a certain TTL. It's all pretty cool. Uh, I can't, don't know if you can see the code at the back, but on the left, uh, I'm curling against the database read-only secret. It's giving me a username and password. The lease is uh, three, uh, 3,600, which is an hour. So let's say I'm giving this to a developer and saying, okay, you have read-only access to this particular part of the database um, for an hour. And then you can even revoke that at any time as well. Uh, and then on the right, I'm just logging into PSQL using those credentials. Um, you can actually configure what uh, the user you're actually can, using can use. So what tables can you access and that kind of thing with a saved SQL query. It's all pretty cool. So I don't want to talk too much about Vault because Vault is awesome and I recommend people use it, but there are other things that you can uh, do this with. So we talked before about defense in depth and reducing the blast radius. So the iteration we have now is that we've got these revocable iterable credentials. Do we know if we're giving people too much access. If you give, if someone's like, oh, I just need to run this one command on a system, would you give them full pseudo root access or would you give them the one command they need? So one of the cool things you can do is there is a policy advisor within AWS. So let's say you've given someone certain permissions in AWS. They've got a credential they can use to pull off various things. They're talking to CloudTrail, they're pulling stuff from S3. What you can do is go into this policy advisor and it will list which particular parts of the API it's been using. So let's say you've given someone full blown access to everything. They don't need it, but they, they asked for X, Y, and Z and you said, sure, let's just give you the full thing. You can go in here and actually audit what's been used after a certain amount of time. Doesn't mean you should just go turning everything off blindly because maybe they haven't had a chance to use it yet. But if they've had the credential for six months and they've only been using the same credential for the certain endpoint, you can probably be like, cool, let's reduce the blast, raid, uh, bl uh, blast radius. And again, obviously this isn't tied to Vault, this is entirely an AWS thing, so this would work whatever technology you're using. But it is one of the things that we're doing in the future, and we actually had a keynote about it last year. Um, and basically some of this detection, it's not machine learning, it's not AI, it's just doing some simple going, okay, you're hitting these endpoints, these ones aren't being used to make the blast radius smaller, I'm gonna take them away from you automatically. But what's the best kind of secret? A secret that can't be leaked. So for example, let's say you're pulling credentials to do a certain lookup. So in this example, we've got an application, it's pulling a photo from S3 bucket. What about there's no credentials in the first place? What about you tie the authentication to the policy of the machine itself? That's where IAM comes from. And that, in that case, the only way you'd get access is access to that machine. So instead of um, worrying about credentials being leaked, your kind of attack vector be, uh, becomes who can have access to that machine. And just like anything else, you can control that with SSH keys, with firewall rules, with VPN rules, and that kind of thing. So the best kind of secret is one that you can't be, can't be leaked. There's no secret here at all. And if you remember when we talked about secrets, um, a secret has to be required. If we remove the requirement for a secret, we're simplifying everything. It's pretty cool. So as we said, the further along the iteration loop we go, the more ethereal and the more top-down things become. So you can't uh, you know, automatically detect everything, but you can start taking all that information in, observing it and logging it. 
So there's a bunch of tools out there, Splunk, uh, Elasticsearch, Datadog, New Relic, CloudTrail, Honeycomb. Um, observability has become the new kind of, but another new buzzword that's kind of come up. Um, and it kind of goes beyond metrics. It's the ability to kind of observe a flow across your entire system. Um, so something like CloudTrail works if you're in a very AWS world because it kind of logs everything in. So you can go like, I'm going to follow my request all the way from here to there. Um, and it's a really powerful thing because you want to be able to um, follow your request and find out what's going on. Um, and it's the only real way to automatically do things and detect these outliers. Um, and there's actually a really cool tool that I saw someone uh, talking about earlier on called Security Onion. It's basically a full stack way of doing this all that has Kibana and Elasticsearch and all logged in. And a really fun one, red teams and attackers. You need to figure out, uh, get someone internally to try and attack your system. Give them a certain credential, least or whatever, and see how much damage they can do. Um, it's really fun, but obviously again, it's, uh, it's harder to scope, it's harder to kind of understand, people aren't familiar with it, people can get very scared, um, but it's a really cool thing. So if you remember going back to that process thing, we've now ticked a lot of boxes. We've now got all of these parts of the secret plan uh, already. So just that one thing we picked, secrets, we've already hit a lot of the areas we've hit, which is pretty cool. Um, and all our teams are happy. The dev now gets to use the applications he needs to use without jumping through hoops. The operations person doesn't have to worry about managing the life cycle of uh, the secret. They can hand that over to the application. Security person is happy because they can automate the process and uh, the policy and leasing process. Secrets have been DevOpsified. Everyone's happy. There's a bunch of other really cool areas to pick. Um, dependency management. So do you know what versions of packages are being used internally? Are you using vulnerable packages? System hardening, authentication, CI, CD, security, with stuff like inspect and danger, like we talked about before. There's a bunch of other things to go look into, but uh, sec uh, secrets are the thing that I've done the most, so it's the stuff I talk about the most. Um, and you want to continue those iteration loops. And keep it up. If you remember the unicorn image from before, you'll end up with something like this. Cool. So we've gone through all this stuff. What have we learned? Security can become the new silo. You want to make sure you break down those silos and get everyone to talk to each other. Um, you want to move security left and make sure that things are being embedded as part of the processes. Um, pick a small area to improve. Don't try and big bang and do everything all at once. It's way easier to do small iterations. Um, secrets are a good test bed. Um, it's one that I've done a lot. It forces you to have those conversations. It forces you to kind of get around that shadow IT problem of people saying like, um, how do I get access to AWS? Who here has worked on a team where some uh, person, you know, either internally or externally, has gone rogue and just spun up some AWS stuff with a company credit card or a personal credit card or done something themselves? Okay, surprisingly honest room, because I've definitely seen that in multiple companies I've been in. Um, take the area you've picked and iterate on it. Um, remember that security is not a product, it's processes, it's workflows, everything like that. Uh, but regardless of that, Vault is still cool and try it out. Cool, so you've heard it from me. You wanna learn more about it. There's a bunch of really cool stuff out there. Um, there's a really good talk from Tim Anderson from AWS. He actually talks a lot about integrating the security process um, into your uh, team. Um, there's a really good DevOps, uh, DevSecOps white paper from DevSecCon, uh, who are a company that do um, kind of conferences just around the kind of sec part of DevOps. Um, one of the really good ones in there is the uh, State of the Union talk. Um, it basically goes through and talks about a lot of different talks. It's kind of like a talk within a talk and goes through a lot of cool things. Um, and yeah, the guys from Signal are really good. They do a lot of really good talks about DevOps because they have a DevOps, uh, security product, so they talk a lot about that. Cool. Thank you very much.